Welcome to the third and final part of the Turing SAP1 series. In this video, I'll go over the code that goes in the EEPROM in the Finite State Automata to make the machine emulate an SAP1. I've got an awesome surprise for you at the end of the video, so make sure you hang around for that. If you think you get value from this series, then please like, share, and subscribe. Leaving comments also really helps. Before we go over the programming model, I just want to spend a little bit of time looking at the circuit. I use two clock signals clock 1 and clock 2 to form a three-phase clock. Clock 1 is really just for clocking the EEPROM to turn a 16-bit wide output into a 32-bit wide output. Clock 2 is really the main system clock. In phase 0, they're both low. Phase 1, clock 1's high. And in phase 2, clock 2's high. As soon as clock 2 goes low, we do a static RAM read. The data from this read is combined with the state output from the previous clock cycle, and we do an EEPROM lookup. We latch the output of the EEPROM into a pair of octal D-type flip-flops, and then do another EEPROM read. This time, the EEPROM has one address line different, which is the clock 1 input. Then on the rising edge of clock 2, we latch this 16 bits into a different pair of octal D-type flip-flops. So now we've actually read 32 bits out of the EEPROM. Finally, when clock 2 goes high, we do our write to the static RAM. This is our clock cycle for the entire machine. Does it matter that we have our first 16 bits available before we have the second 16 bits? Not really. I've arranged it so that the W bus output is latched on the rising edge of clock 1, but this data is only really needed while clock 2 is high, which is when we do the static RAM right. This just means that the data is sitting in the flip-flops for a while before we use it. The other piece of information in that first 16 bits out of the EEPROM is the notepad address. Here I've called it NPTEMP. This data gets clocked into another flip-flop on the falling edge of clock 2, so it doesn't really matter if this data is available early in the clock cycle. The data coming out of the EEPROM latched on clock 2 is a lot more time sensitive. This includes the state, which we want to use for the next clock cycle, and the memory read and write signals, which we need to use immediately. This is the circuit I've used to generate the clock. It's just two D-type flip-flops, so I've used a 74HC74. The NOR gate on the upper flip-flop just ensures that clock 1 will be low, following a clock period where either clock 1 or clock 2 is set. Clock 2 is just clock 1 delayed by one clock pulse. Here I'm adding the 74HC74 and the 74HC02 that make up the clock circuit. The precise details are in a schematic, which you can get from the link below. The other thing the machine needs to be able to do is decide whether to use the memory address register or the notepad pointer during memory accesses. At any one point in time, only one of these registers should be driving the address bus into the static RAM. When mread and mwrite are both low, it means you want to be using a notepad variable, so notepad OE should be low and mar OE should be high. When mwrite's set, we want to use the notepad pointer during the read cycle, and we want to use the memory address register during the write cycle. When M reads high, we want to use the memory address register during the read cycle while clock 2 is low, but we want to use the notepad pointer for the write cycle when clock's high. When both M read and M write are high, then we want to use the memory address register for both cycles. If we look when clock 2 is low, we see that notepad OE is the same as mread, and mar OE is mread bar. Let me fill these in on the diagram. Now let's have a look and see what happens when clock 2 is set. Notepad OE is the same as mwrite, and mar OE is the same as mwrite bar. Let me update these. What we see is that when clock 2 is low, mar OE bar is mread bar, and notepad OE bar is mread. But when clock 2 is high, mar OE bar is m right bar, and notepad OE bar is m right. One way to implement this sort of logic is to use the 74HC257. This is a quad 2 input multiplexer. When clock 2 is low, the signal on pin 2 goes to pin 4, and the signal on pin 5 goes to pin 7. But when clock 2 is high, pin 3 goes to pin 4, and pin 6 goes to pin 7. The finite state machine actually produces mread, mwrite, mread bar, and mwrite bar. By connecting them up this way, 
Only one of the notepad register or memory address register can be selected at any one point in time. The 74HC257 is part of our build list. The signals that feed it, mread, mwrite, mreadbar and mwritebar are all available from this 574. The outputs from the 257 are connected to the output enable pins on the memory address register and the notepad address register. I also connect up the notepad address register output enable to A16 on the static RAM. This divides the address space in two, and the main memory, which is accessed by the memory address register, is the lower portion of the static RAM, while all the variables used by the emulator that are pointed to by the notepad register are in the upper half of the static RAM. Let me just finish off wiring up this part of the circuit. There is a slight quirk we need to know about when programming, and that is that the mwrite signal applies to the current clock cycle, whereas the mread signal applies to the next clock cycle. We can do this, it just causes a bit of a headache in our programming model, that's all. Until I got used to it, this caused many bugs. I'm going to use state diagrams to program this machine, but I want to go over them in a little bit more detail before I start. And to understand their physical correlation with the actual machine, let's have a quick look at the EEPROM output. The lower 16 bits are output when clock 1 is low. It contains 8 bits of the W bus, which gets sent to the static RAM when clock 2 is high. It contains the notepad pointer address. It also contains these out and memory address register clock signals. These are just directly derived from the notepad pointer address. These signals clock the out and the memory address register. The notepad address or notepad pointer register is always clocked on the falling edge of clock 2. The out and memory address register clock signals need another pair of flip-flops to align with the entire machine cycle. That's what this 74HC174 is for. I wire them up directly to the output of the finite state machine. Now these signals are actually available on the output of the notepad register as well, except the notepad register's output gets disabled. I did try and get away with using the notepad register output with some pull-up resistors, but a short transitory spike could get through when the 574 was disabled, and this would corrupt the data inside the memory address register. So I decided to give the out and memory address register clock signals their own chip. Connecting up these wires is probably the fiddliest part of the whole build. You'll notice that I'm avoiding using long wires, and using multiple connections to the breadboard instead. You can see me doing it right now. This does add resistance to the wire and the potential for another contact failure. But I've found that long bendy wires like this one are just less mechanically secure. If I want to restart the board at some point in the future, I don't have to deal with half falling out wires. We get another 16 bits out of the EEPROM when clock one's high. This contains the next state, which is fed back into the address lines on the EEPROM. It also contains read write, read bar, and write bar. Let's see how our EEPROM output relates to our finite state machine. We can see the upper arrow coming out of the EEPROM is our next state. The middle arrow is our write symbol, while the lower black arrow is our notepad pointer. To draw a state diagram, we represent each possible state as a circle with a number inside it. The number obviously signifies the state. Next, we have a number of lines coming out of the state. These are called arcs. We have one arc for every possible value of the read symbol, and we label each arc with the read symbol that it represents. Here, the upper line is for a read symbol value of 0, and the lower line is for a read symbol value of 1. Obviously, for 256 read symbols, we really need 256 arcs. Each arc leads to another state, and each of these new states is determined by the current state and the read symbol. By the way, I tend to use rule and state interchangeably here. But if we're in state 251 and we see a 0, we go to state 252. But if in 251 we see a 1, then we go to state 290. This next state is directly output from our EEPROM, latched into some flip-flops on the positive edge of clock 2, and it feeds back into the EEPROM for the next cycle. The other outputs from the EEPROM are the write symbol and the notepad address, and we tend to just directly write them on the arc as well. 
In this case, if we see a zero, we might want to write back a one, and if we see a one, we might want to write back a two. We also label the arc with the notepad pointer for the next cycle. Here, the notepad address is the same for both arcs, but they can be different. Finally, we have the memory read and memory write signal. These are just assumed to be zero unless otherwise stated underneath the arc itself. In this case, we want the lower arc to perform a memory read on the next cycle. Originally, I crossed out some hardware on Ben Eater's SAP1, such as the program counter, accumulator, and B register, but we actually need to store these as variables on our notepad. Here, I've drawn the A register at location 0, B at 1, status register at 2, and so forth. This variable assignment was somewhat arbitrary. Ben Eater's SAP1 machine is a von Neumann architecture, and one of the distinctive features is the fetch, decode, execute cycle. The machine is just constantly looping through these. In RISC architectures, these actually overlap, but I won't go into that here. In the fetch stage, the next instructions read from main memory. In the decode phase, we interpret this. And for CPUs with more complex addressing modes, we also compute the effective address in decode. The next phase is execute. And we're really referring to the upper definition here, not the lower one. Finally, the whole cycle repeats again. We're going to need to be able to reproduce this with our state machine. State 0 is our reset state, and I'll go over that in a minute. But state 1 is our fetch state. We expect to come into this state with the notepad pointing at the program counter variable. We read the value, and we write back the value plus 1. We set it up so that when we write to the program counter, this gets mirrored in the memory address register as well. Then in state 1, we go to state 2, and we instruct the machine to do a main memory read. It does this during the first phase of the clock, but we want our write symbol to go to the IREG, which is the instruction register. It's important to note that this memory read and the notepad address as part of these arcs out of state 1 actually apply in state 2. This machine is instruction set compatible with Ben Eater's SAP1. The first five instructions are from Albert Paul Malvino's original design. Ben added the LDI, jump, jump on carry, and jump on zero instructions. Out and halt were in the original design as well. The entire instruction is 8 bits wide. The upper 4 bits specifies the instruction, and the lower 4 bits is an operand, which is usually an address or an immediate value in the case of LDI. Now here's the tricky part. In state 2, which is decode, we jump to a whole bunch of different machines based on the value we've read in from the main memory. This is somewhat analogous to this piece of C code here that you might find in an emulator. State 2 is effectively performing the same function as this switch statement, and each arc out of state 2 is represented by one of the case clauses. I suggest you take a moment and see if you can correlate this code with the state machine diagram for states 1 and 2. Just to recap, we increment the program counter, we read that value from main memory and put it into our instruction register, and then we jump to a state machine that represents that instruction. Let's start with load and store. The X's in all these arc labels mean that we don't care what's in the lower four bits. To go down the LDA pathway, it means that the value we read from main memory contained a one in the upper four bits. The lower four bits contains an address. So we read it from main memory, and we store it in our iReg. I've created a project in Visual Studio 22. Now I'm just laying down a bunch of hash defines at the moment. This represents the start state for all of these little machines that I'm going to be building. I'm doing it manually here, but for larger CPUs, I get the software to do it automatically. I define the storage location for all the variables. Now obviously all these variables are 8-bit bytes. Now I just have some special signals to worry about, mread, mwrite, and so forth. This is the main data structure that I use per EEPROM entry. It has a next state, a write symbol, notepad address, and outputs used to store mread and mwrite. Now I'm going to make a two-dimensional array of these, and we need an entry for every possible combination of state and read symbol. I'm doing this mainly to program the EEPROM, but I also want an emulator to make sure it's working properly, so I'm going to use this one-dimensional array to represent my static RAM. I need the opcodes for the program that generates the Fibonacci sequence. 
Now I'm just going to write a couple of interface routines that allow me to set a rule and to get a rule. Now generally I probably would have used a class to do this, but I want to keep this code as simple as possible. I'm going through it very fast here, but this code is available through my GitHub repository, links below. It contains a Visual Studio solution, but it should be pretty straightforward to port it to other platforms. The idea is to use the set rule function when generating the state machine, then have another piece of code that actually programs the EEPROM, but it uses the get rule routine to get the information it needs. The emulator will also use get rule, and I'll use that to make sure the code's working. This is where we really get into it. I'm going to generate a function called generate rulebook. I'll start with the reset rule, which is located at state zero. For every possible value of symbol, I want to jump to another machine called rule program. I'll go over this a bit later, but basically it just writes the Fibonacci program into the static RAM. Now I'm going to write the state that does the fetch. We come into this state assuming that the previous state set the notepad pointer to point to the program counter variable. I set the next state to be our decode state machine. Then for any value of i we find in the program counter, we want to write back i plus 1, but we want it to wrap around at 16. We want the notepad pointer to point to the instruction register, but we also want to do a main memory read so we load our instruction from the SRAM. I'm going to build the state machine for decode. Remember that after I've read the instruction from memory, I branch off to one of these 11 state machines. I'm going to use this switch statement. Now remember, this switch statement doesn't get executed at runtime. It's just there to program the decode rule. If the upper four bits of the instruction contain 0, 1, then I want to perform an LDA. So in state 2, decode, for all input symbols with an upper nibble of 1, then the next machine is the LDA state machine. Similarly, in state 2, for all input symbols with a 6 in the upper four bits, then I want the next state to be the jump state machine. So hopefully you can see that rule decode, which is state 2, is performing the decode by determining the next state based on the input character, which in this case happens to be our instruction. I'll look at the load and store instructions at the same time because they're very similar. We come into the LDA state machine with the notepad pointer pointing at the I reg, but this time we want to focus on the lower four bits of our instruction. If it contains a zero, we go to state four. If it contains a one, we go to state five. And we continue this all the way up to state 19 for a value of 15, which is 0f in hexadecimal. So now the address for the load is actually stored in the state number. You may want to go over this again yourself just to make sure you understand it. Next, we write a value into the effective address register based on our current state. This has the effect of writing the address into the effective address register. I've programmed the EEPROM so that whenever the notepad points to the program counter or the effective address register, it toggles the MAR bit in the EEPROM output. This gets reflected on the output of the 74HC174, which ultimately clocks the memory address register. This means that any write to the program counter variable or the effective address register variable will be physically clocked into this 74HC574, which is the memory address register. The information is written to both the static RAM and the memory address register, and this happens automatically. The person writing the code doesn't need to worry about it. I need to be a little bit careful with terminology here. A register variable is something stored in the static RAM, while a register is a physical chip on the board. Back to the LDA state machine, I instruct a memory read to occur in the next state. I set the notepad pointer to be the A register variable, then in state 20, it does a main memory read. The address for this read originally came from the lower four bits of the instruction. Then in the second part of state 20, when clock two's high, it writes back this value to the A register variable in the static RAM. The reason it writes back the exact same value is because we instructed it to here, in all the state transitions out of state 20. When we're done, we go back to the fetch state machine. We just need to make sure that the notepad pointer contains the location of the program counter variable. Now I'm going to write the code that generates state 3. I need a different entry for every possible value of symbol. Here's the tricky bit. 
I set the next state to be the current state plus one plus the lower four bits of the symbol. This causes the fanning out from state three. Now we need to generate states four through 19. Don't forget I'm using the term rule and state somewhat interchangeably here. Let's just finish off state three. I've made a slight mistake in this code. The upper limit on this loop should be 16, not the number of symbols. I'll fix it later. I want all paths out of rule 4 to 19 to go to rule 20. I also want to perform a read in rule 20 and have the notepad pointer point to the A register variable. Increment the rule number in the outer loop. In rule 20, I make sure that the value I read from memory is the same as the one I write to the A register. Then I just jump back to fetch, which completes the fetch decode execute cycle. The first part of store A is very similar. I convert the lower four bits of the instruction register into state. This time it states 91 to 106. Then I write this value into the memory address register, again using the effective address register variable. Now this is where the instructions are different. I don't want to perform a main memory read. Rather, I want to read the value in the A register variable, then write it to main memory using the mwrite signal. We make sure it's the same value by controlling the arcs out of rule 107. If we wanted to store the value of minus A, for example, this is where we'd change it. I can cut and paste the LDA code to make my SDA instruction. I need to remove the reads and replace it with a write at rule 107. Load immediate is also very similar. The main difference is that instead of writing the lower four bits into the effective address register variable, I just write them directly into the A register variable. No memory reads or writes are required. Again, I can cut and paste the LDA instruction to make the LDI instruction. I change EA to A reg, and then I just jump directly back to fetch. This is where I realize that the outer loop for all of these instructions should only have 16 entries rather than 256. We are making phenomenal progress, now let's have a look at the jump instructions and see how much code we can reuse. For jump carry and jump zero, I want to enter the state machines with the notepad register pointing to the status register variable. I read it, check the bit I'm interested in, then select either fetch or jump as my next state. If bit zero of the status register variable is clear, then I go to fetch. But if it's set, I go to jump. This is how we do a conditional branch. Jump if zero is almost identical, except we test bit one of our status register variable, which is our zero flag. If it's clear, we go to fetch, and if it's set, we go to jump. Coding this up is pretty straightforward, it's just a single rule for each. The read symbol is our status register variable. For all values where bit zero is set, we go to jump, and when it's clear, we go to fetch. We copy and paste it for jump on zero, give it a new rule number, then we change the bit we're interested in from bit zero to bit one. The jump state machine is very similar to the LDI state machine, except there are two important differences. First, the lower four bits from the instruction register variable are written back to the program counter variable rather than the A register variable. This is how we actually do the jump. The other big difference is that we do our own fetch. That's what this M reads for. The normal fetch cycle pre-increments the program counter to make sure that its value is in the memory address register. In this case, the program counter already points to the next instruction, and we know that its value is already stored in the memory address register, so we can just jump straight to the decode state machine. I cut and paste the LDI instruction, give it a new rule number, modify the destination to be the program counter variable, then I just need to modify it so that all 16 of these states perform their own fetch and jump to decode. Now we're going to look at the big ones, add and subtract, and this is where we generate our large 64k entry lookup table. The first part of add is very similar to our LDA instruction, except we want the destination to be the B register rather than the A register. Let's look at them side by side. You'll see that the only difference is the use of the B register variable instead of the A register variable. So I should be able to use my LDA code for at least this much of it. I'll cut and paste LDA to start my add instruction, change all the rule numbers, and make sure I use the B reg instead of the A reg variable. 
the state machine that actually does the 8-bit addition, I'm going to call add 8. Rule 38 reads the B register variable, then goes to one of 256 different states, from 178 to 433, based on the value in the B register variable. So if the B register variable contains 0, it goes to rule 178. If it contained a 1, it goes to rule 179. And if the B register variable contained 255, or FF in hexadecimal, then it goes to rule 433. What we've done is encode the value of B into our state number. Next, for all these states containing all the possible values of B, we read in the A register, and we write back the value of A plus B. Because we have 256 states, with 256 symbols each, this forms our 64k lookup table. We know what two numbers were added together. Therefore, we can tell if there was a carry out and if the result was zero. We can use this information to determine what state to go to next. If we add zero to zero, we know that we want to set the zero flag but clear the carry flag. That's what state 434 does. It reads the status register variable, and no matter what value is there, it writes back 0 too. We need to have four separate states for all possible combinations of 0 and carry. Once we're done, we go back to fetch. Now I need to write the code that does the 8-bit addition. There's two nested loops. Both have 256 iterations. J represents the state number, and it's effectively the same as B while i is effectively the same as a. This machine does the addition when it's generating the EEPROM and stores it in the lookup table. So this is effectively where the addition's occurring. We check for zero and carry, and then we generate the next state based on the status of carry and zero. The notepad pointer needs to be pointing at the status register for the next state. Then we just instantiate all four possibilities for zero and carry, and jump to fetch when we're done. Hopefully you can see that I can use the same technique to generate AND, OR, EXCLUSIVE OR, and COMPARE instructions. ADD and SUBTRACT are very similar. The left-hand side of the SUBTRACT STATE machine is copied and pasted from ADD, but the right-hand side of the STATE machine actually uses the same states as ADD. The main difference occurs here. In SUBTRACTION, we choose the next state which represents minus B rather than B. For example, in addition, if we read in a 1, we go to state 179, which means we want to add 1 to A. In subtraction, if we see a 1, we go to rule 433, which adds FF to A, which is the same as subtracting 1. Rule 89 is effectively performing this negation operation that I showed in the last video. I can copy and paste the add instruction, change the rule number to be subtract, and here's the tricky bit. I choose the next state to be the number associated with minus B rather than the number associated with B. Then I go ahead and add A with minus B, and there we have it, A minus B. The SAP1 has an output register, so I've made this one of the variables I store in the static RAM. I read A and fan out to a state representing the value of A. Then based on that state, I write a value into the output register. Now, in retrospect, I probably would have done this completely differently. I'd keep it as one state where we read from A, then write back to A, then have the EEPROM generator recognize this state and toggle the output signal on the EEPROM. I don't think I'm going to change it now, but note to self. I'm going to cut and paste the LDI instruction for this. I need to change the notepad pointer to be the output register, and I need to do it for all 256 values rather than 16. The last piece of code we have copies the Fibonacci code into the memory. The program counter walks through the memory from 0 to 15. Then we do a read from A, we ignore it, and we write into main memory the value from our lookup table for the Fibonacci code. It means that the Fibonacci program's hard-coded into our EEPROM, but in all honesty, I'm not planning to write a lot of code for the SAP1. This is just a demonstration. Here's the code for the emulator. First, we read from the static RAM. We use either the memory address register or the notepad pointer based on the status of mread. We look up our rule book, which in hardware is an EEPROM read from a location determined by the current rule and the symbol that we've just read. 
we write back the value into the static RAM. We use either the memory address register or the notepad pointer based on the status of mwrite. We update the output register. In this case, that takes the form of a printf. If our notepad pointer contained the address of the program counter variable or the effective address variable, then we write this value into the memory address register. We update the notepad pointer to the value we read from the EEPROM. And then we make our next rule from the EEPROM, our current rule. Let's run the code and see what we get. That looks pretty good. I'll burn the EEPROMs and give it a try. Success. In the interest of time, I'm not going to really talk about how the display works, but it's very similar to Ben Eater's. It reads the 8 bits on the output register and converts it into a decimal number. There are details in the schematic diagram. Let's just watch it run for a little while. Seems to be generating the correct sequence. 144, should be 233, then back to 1. Excellent. Now, one of the first things many people do when they build an SAP 1 is increase the size of the memory. There's just not a lot you can do with 16 bytes, and we want to see these machines doing something useful. The first thing I'm going to do is make the memory address register 16 bits rather than 8. This chip goes here in our block diagram. It makes our static RAM interface 16 bits wide. I've put some resistors on the upper lines for when I'm using the notepad pointer, and the second memory address register uses our old output signal. This is a replica of our SAP1 board, but I've removed the clock and the display. I'll insert some more jumpers that let me connect in another 74HC574. These connect up to pins A8 through A15 on the static RAM, and the input comes from the W bus. I've made this interface board in KiCad. It'll let me connect an Arduino Mega to the breadboard pins. This is what the board itself looks like, and this is what KiCad predicts it'll look like in 3D. I had quite a lot of problems with this, actually. Some of the breadboards had a pin pitch that wasn't exactly a tenth of an inch. When you have 64 pins in a row, this becomes a problem. But I found that these transparent breadboards are exactly the right size. This is what it looks like in real life with an Arduino Mega mounted to it. Let me plug that in. So the Mega provides the clock and the reset, and it snoops on the address and data lines for the static RAM, so it gets to see all of the memory reads and writes. The other change I made was to the EEPROM. I changed to an instruction set that takes advantage of the 64K address space. The Arduino is connected via USB to a PC, which is driving this display. Let's see what we have. Pac-Man. Now I had to edit this slightly to get a more interesting display, but this is running at about a third real time. By adding in a second memory address register and changing the code in our EEPROM to emulate a 6502, we can now play Apple II Pac-Man. So, surprise. We essentially go from this memory layout for the SAP1 to this memory layout for the 6502. But the only thing we've added is this extra memory address register. I also had to use a couple of spare bits to expand the state variable from 10 bits to 12. I suspect if I used a 50 nanosecond EEPROM and 50 nanosecond static RAM, I could get this to run in real time. That's it for this video series. I hope you've enjoyed it and learnt a lot along the way. This is a more software-oriented approach than Ben Eater's, but I suspect a lot of my audience are software engineers, and this programmable approach has a lot of appeal. So like, share and subscribe, and leaving comments really helps.